This is Tall Tale TV, your podcast for sci-fi and fantasy short stories. My Country by Reddit user Because I Said So Too. I look at my country, its institutions, monuments, and citizens differently now, and the rest of the world does too. Now that the literal dust has settled, we can make sense of what happened. Almost. Most of us can remember where we were when we heard the news. I had just gotten to work and had gotten an alert on my phone about Mount Rushmore being destroyed, which I guess you could say was fake news, because it was followed by additional alerts, saying it was an avalanche, no, an earthquake, and then aerial footage came in of what it actually was. Mount Rushmore hadn't exploded. It had stood up, explosively violently shaking off trees, rocks, and huge clods of dirt. It appeared to be a huge robot, carved out of massive slabs of rock, one with four familiar stoic faces. A huge robot that was, impossibly, now running through the South Dakota wilderness, trailing dust and devastation in its wake. I refused to believe it at first. Most of us did. Till reports from other media sources confirmed it. And footage started trickling in of crushed bodies, cars, homes, towns, and cities. The monster, and that's what it really was, seemed set on causing the maximum amount of death and destruction possible. And nothing could stop it. It could swap planes and helicopters out of the sky, step on tanks, and dodge rockets. It ignored artillery fired at it and moved fast, running with huge strides that crushed the landscape beneath its tread. I, my co-workers, my countrymen, and the world watched in horror as a national monument perverted beyond recognition went on a rampage, destroying my fellow Americans, our country, and to some degree, our national sanity. Because, as we watched in shocked disbelief, the mantra that went through my mind, all of our minds, was that this was insane, this was impossible, and that this couldn't be happening. But it was. We all saw the horror of it, scenes of death and devastation as it tore through an American state like a knife through skin, cutting deeper and deeper. And then the news came in of the Statue of Liberty's forced evacuation, and then its explosion. That's what they thought at first, that it had exploded. A moment later, that was revised. It hadn't exploded. It had launched off its pedestal and was now headed inland. It was at first assumed that the statue was a missile, that it had been all along, a nuclear missile hidden in plain sight, one that had now been launched by our leaders at the rampaging monster on American soil. Photos and video footage captured its flight as it arched through the spacious sky, Lady Liberty, torch aloft, her face calm and placid, flying to her doom, to unspeakable devastation, the horror of a nuclear detonation on American soil. A lone cameraman filmed her landing. It was a live satellite feed, and I'm sure he expected to be annihilated in the explosion. Liberty missed hitting down several hundred feet away from Mount Rushmore. She landed in a billow of dust and failed to explode. I heard a collective moan of despair from my co-workers around me. We had gathered around the TV in the conference room at this point, and we could smell each other's fear and terror. And then from the settling dust, Liberty rose up. 
We, as one, recoiled from the TV. Here was another living monument, another monster, another horror. But then, Liberty, with a strange stop-motion grace, aimed her torch at the huge, mountainous figure looming over her, and from it she released a blast of blinding light. She was fighting for us. She was tiny, a fraction of the size of the monster, but she was quick. She was armed with her torch. She used her tablet as a shield against the rocks the monster hurled, and she kept her distance. She fired shot after shot at the monster with four faces, chipping away at the stone. It roared with four mouths and staggered backwards, and as it staggered back, she fired again, directly into Washington's open mouth. The monster, dazed and flailing its massive limbs, fell backwards, flattening the land behind it. Lady Liberty strolled closer, tiny in comparison. She raised her torch, aimed, and then stopped. She dropped her tablet and torch and seemed to clutch at her chest, as though she was having a heart attack. And then she collapsed at the feet of the monster, which had stopped thrashing and was starting to roll over. It was starting to rise up. The nation screamed in horror, screamed for her to get up, get up. And she started to, rising slowly, clumsily. And the monster did the same, but faster. It got to its feet, too, and loomed above her. It was scarred, but not damaged. And its three and a half remaining faces glared down at its tiny, clumsy, struggling adversary. Something had changed. She was slower now, awkward, and she scrambled away from one huge, stomping foot and barely avoided another swatting hand. She dived clumsily for her torch and was hit by a massive rock the monster hurled at her. She was damaged, but had her weapon now and she raised it shakily and fired it again and again at the stone faces, fired again and again till the control room was exposed, fired as the monster lumbered towards her, and as it collapsed on top of her, she thrust a damaged and broken hand into the smoking crater where the monster's central two faces had been, and as the mountain fell on her, she killed its controller. Emergency personnel pulled three people from the rubble that day. A crazed loner who had been hiking and had discovered the control room for the mountain, the monster, Mount Rushmore. They had to use the jaws of life to pry his crushed corpse out of Liberty's grasp. Inside of Liberty, they found two more people. One was the janitor who had launched her and started the battle. He was an elderly veteran of two wars and had worked undercover as the janitor at the Statue of Liberty for over 40 years. At the climactic moment of the battle, his brave, aged heart had failed him, and he collapsed in his harness, clutching at his chest, slowly, painfully dying. He, we, had been fortunate, though. He had an assistant there with him, a young Mexican man who had recently become a citizen and had just been hired as a junior member of the janitorial crew. He had been with the old man when the news broke, seen the old man's face go pale with shock. He'd helped him into the harness, and when the old man's heart had failed him, he grabbed the controls asking the dying man questions in broken English, doing his best to understand the old man's gasping replies, fighting for both of their lives, fighting for ours as well. When they pulled the men from the rubble, the younger man had his arms around the body of the old man. The younger man had tried to protect him till the end. The nation saw its heroes, 
its saviors birthed from the rubble. One frail, pale, and sadly gone, and the other with dark skin covered in bruises, scratches, and blood, and dark eyes that looked imploringly into the reporter's cameras, as if asking them, asking us, to help his friend, and to help him. I look at my country differently now, don't you? Writing under his Reddit username, because I said so too, has plenty more where this came from. If you'd like to check out more of his work, you can find him at reddit.com slash user slash because I said so too. Hey guys, I know the story was a little different, but in light of the recent midterm craziness, I thought it would be a great piece to wind things down with. So to my fellow Americans, whether your side won or lost, or if that piece of legislation didn't go the way you wanted, just remember one thing. At least our national monuments aren't rampaging across the country. That and we're all still neighbors. We might disagree on what's best for the country, but that's the one thing we can agree on. We all want what's best for the country. So if you get a chance, try to reach across that divide and realize, like it or not, we're going to have to work together to get there. Remember, you can now follow me on YouTube or the Tall Tale TV podcast. I'm Chris Heron, and that's it for today's Tall Tale TV.